So the trade-off basically was um, we're going to, uh, in 1992, um, <coughs> we'll give you half ownership of sea lords, half that is, and 20% um, of all new species and the quid pro quo or the pound of flesh is that you give us your treaty rights. That was the trade-off. Now I represented uh, five tribes including Moriori. We were the first to file an opposition to the Sea Lords deal. We went through the Waitangi Tribunal, the High Court, Court of Appeal and we even talked about the case to the United Nations um, on the basis that it, we felt it was wrong to having just acknowledged the treaty right and, and settled to then remove the fundamental basis of that right from the legislation because it's one thing to honour a treaty um, commitment and obligation is another thing to extinguish it and that's what you know so the what um, Moriori and the other tribes I represented as a matter of principle it was wrong to extinguish rights in 1992 and I still believe that it was wrong to do that I think what created division and what polarised people was the extinguishment of our rights. It made people afraid, paranoid. If they didn't get a slice of the cake, then um, that, would, that, would, that was the only chance they had. We've become um, litigation happy and uh, as soon as we run into a problem, we grab a lawyer. And in fact, the other problem that comes with it before we get to the problem, we've got a lawyer who tells us there's a problem, so we need to hire him to tell us how to get out of the problem. And the other side gets a lawyer because they know we've got a lawyer, so we go down that, that litigious track um, once more. And what I've noticed on a, quite a number of occasions is that the tribes, in hiring lawyers, uh, instead of giving the lawyers the direction and seeking the technical advice of their lawyers, as they would of accountants, they actually abrogate the power of the tribe to the lawyers. In the Christchurch meeting, I banned all lawyers, and um, and I allowed lawyers to come only if they came in their tribal persona, and a number of lawyers did come, and I banned lawyers from Wellington again, and and lawyers uh, representing their own tribes, uh, who came as as their tribes also came, and the one mistake I made, uh, and we were almost uh, close to clinching a deal, um, Kara chaired the meeting here in Christchurch for me. And we broke out on a number of occasions to do side deals between the Chatham Islands. How would we, 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 we look after the Chathams, given that the deep sea fisheries were very rich and that uh, they saw these as theirs and we came to some arrangements. We broke a deal, side deal with Nai Taho. We talked to the North and Dick Dargaville and, and um, um, the Nai Taho representative would meet in a side corridor with me. So all these things were happening over a period of week. We came to Wellington. And just about two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, one of the uh, tribal representatives, who was a lawyer, she raised her hand and said that she thought that we might be uh, helpfully instructed by uh, a lawyer colleague of hers, uh, giving us some information about issues around fishing legal aspects. My instinct really told me that I should have said no, but I, I canvassed around, cut a canvas around, and we said yes. David Baragranath entered the room and the deal was gone. And, and I think from that day on, we got enmeshed in the tortuous, horribly expensive legal um, um, systems we got. I mean, what he said is perfectly sensible, but what he did do was he forced tribes back into their, their positions. Uh, and I think at the end of that meeting, we, we closed up and said, we can't go. What the Sea Lord deal tells us is that we've, we've got a, some way to go yet to get our own internal processes sorted out. I mean, we're, we're, the fact that we're arguing in the courts, either between uh, those who support Mana Moana in the early days and those who supported um, Mata Toru Te Tangata, or that the distribution should occur on the population base, uh, indicates that we're, we've either lost the ability to negotiate and robustly argue amongst ourselves, or that we've become so reliant on the Western uh, paradigm, the Western systems of legal, of having lawyers to represent our interests, that we've actually abrogated power. And, and I think that's, that's, that's really something that we as Māori have to, to look at, that, that, that we have to retake the power. And in my, my personal view is, you have to have personal rangatiratanga in order to be able to, to, to make the personal choices and to determine the direction that you want to go. I guess it's been exacerbated because of litigation, ongoing litigation and that the courts are just not in a position to solve these 
Maori Maori issues, you know. And the sad thing is that it's instead of Maori uh, fighting against the crown, they're fighting against themselves. And so for me, Mike, um, I, I, there needs to be in this country. I mean. Uh, I mean, let's face it, Māori should have their self-control and self-determination and tenoranga teratanga control and direction over their own um, futures. But in, in terms of the current paradigm, we have the Waitangi Tribunal that investigates claims by Māori against the Crown. We have the Māori Land Court to look at land court issues and some mandate issues. We have the, high, the civil courts to look at um, uh, complaints under the under the legal system, but there's no um, mechanism for solving Maori disputes Maori b between Maori. So there needs to be some kind of um, format for doing that, based on maybe um, looking at the Marae Tikanga protocols, the tribunal, the Maori Land Court, some special body that's developed so that we don't end up um, beating the shit out of one another in the courts and in the media and you know and um, the whole thing being captured by um, uh, people with their own personal agendas and that's th out of it. all of the things Mike in the last 10 years the saddest thing for me is that it's um, this attitude that, that Māori are um, beating up one another and then the media or and the and the public out there, oh there they go again, look at them at one another's throats. You know, you throw them a few bloody breadcrumbs and the squabbling like seagulls on the beach. You know, and that's bloody tragic. I think within ourselves, as Māori, within Māori society, we're very unclear about the treaty as well. And we're very unclear about constitutional issues, what our position is, um, and, and because we don't have that framework, we're all, op all operating off independent individual frameworks and individual uh, independent whānau, hapu and everyone, and it's hardly surprising that a lot of our decision making is inconsistent. So I, I go back to, con I think one of the issues is, is that governments are focused on, on the economy, on jobs, but they, they're failing to address the, the, the political issue which, which is the fundamental issue of the treaty as far as I'm concerned. I'm not surprised what's happened, Mike. I'm not surprised that Māori are at each other's throats and the Crown sitting on the sideline laughing. Well, maybe not laughing, but they're just sort of sitting there twiddling their thumbs because the Sea Lord's deal um, kind of uh, was a portent of what was to, what was to follow. So after extinguishing Māori commercial fishing rights, what was about to come was the fiscal envelope. Good morning to you all. This is what we think of your fiscal envelope. Protesters showed what they thought of Doug Graham's treaty policy. While they protested, My iwi don't need this. the government embarked on what it believes is the most important policy initiative it's undertaken. The government's package will cap Māori settlement claims at a billion dollars. 200 million from that fund has already been paid out, including the Sea Lord deal, leaving 800 million dollars in the fund. The money will be paid out at $100 million a year over 10 years. It amounts to less than 1% of annual government expenditure. That's less than annual foreign aid. This Waitangi Day will be remembered as the one where the Māori people of the far north, both elders and protesters, gave a resounding no to the government's fiscal envelope. Welcome for Māori Affairs Minister John Luxton saw a demonstration of tribal feeling against the settlement document. The fiscal envelope um, uh, is not acceptable in its present, in its in its form and is in its entirety. Treaty Minister Doug Graham arrived at Tariri Marae in the Portiki this morning on a hiding to nothing. Seven tribes from the canoe of Matatu were represented at the Hui. All of them opposed to the government's billion-dollar plan to settle land claims. And we are hopeful now that the Crown will recognise that uh, the process of the fiscal envelope was developed entirely by their own people. Another hui, another rejection, this time from the Hawke's Bay today. And it's the cumulative effect of rejection which has clearly begun to worry the architect of the treaty settlement process. The funding is required in the government to give the negotiators the assets to return. And that funding is part of the fiscal envelope. Total rejection, no money, no land, no settlements. Simple as that. Again, could you explain that further for us? Well, our people volunteered for six years to go away and fight. 
with this country and then they throw this thing at us without any consultation or anything. And it's so horrible, you could change the date on it to the 1800s and there'd be no difference. It's very symbolic that you as a member of the Māori Battalion chooses to stand here and join the march and go onto the Marae like that, isn't it? Yes, of course it is. And that's the reason why we turned up. We tried to turn up to prove a point. This is the latest in a series of Māori protests this year, where Tomarunui locals are occupying the proposed site of a new $3 million police station. 1996, 